You going? You can do a slap. I'll do a slap. Perfect. Nice. Okay, so I'll do all the intros and outros in my bedroom uh, down the line. But okay. uh, to begin with, I'm going to start with a question. Let's go right back to the beginning of the Immersion Fellowship. Um, what, what, what did you feel about Immersion then and how do you feel about it now? Ooh, immersion then and immersion now. That's a really good question. Um, when I first applied for the Immersion Fellowship, I was coming from a background of interactive documentary. So any kind of non-fiction form that was in some way interactive or um, guided by the user. And so um, an immersion was already looking like a very key next step in that field. So a lot of people in the IDOX field were heading towards immersive documentary forms as well so virtual reality augmented reality that kind of thing and so it was something that I was already interested in exploring but I guess I'd come most of the documentary explorations were probably VR focused and so then coming to now one of the things that's done for me is really expand that idea of what immersive media can actually be well beyond VR and um, in a really kind of rich way expanded some of the possibilities of what you can do with those kinds of media forms. Um, I came to it from, I mean, actually from theatre in a way. I, I, like, I guess ten years ago, there was um, was maybe what I'd call the kind of rise of immersive theatre as a really sort of hit buzzword, and a lot of the audio walks I was making and things like that, people we're calling it immersive theatre. And it was really frustrating me because um, I was kind of in the mindset of, no, this is about being present in the world. This isn't, Im like the content is not supposed to be immersing you, it's supposed to be making you more present in the world. And then sort of jump forward to to last year and, and we'd sort of gone into mediated immersion, the sort of rise of like VR and AR as, you know, whether it was from industry kind of funded schemes or just this, is it the second or third wave of VR? I guess it's like third, third, think, third yeah. wave of VR, you know, and that, and then that's what immersive became. And, and I sort of reached a frustration again of like, there's more to this term than, um, than these, than cocooning, you know, and so I think um, yeah, that's where I came into it. And where did I come out the end? I don't think I've, I don't think I've changed my opinion on immersion coming out of it. Um, I think what I've kind of done is I've taken the time to try and think about the. the Bless you. <laughs> to, to, I've taken the time to try and think about. <laughs> it's one of those days. The different, the different things. Uh, the different qualities of immersion, actually. I mm. think that's what I kind of like more to think about it more in a more granular way. But I'm still frustrated about the way people use the term. But that's, you know. Yeah, it's an interesting one because actually this morning I went back to look at some of the notes I made for myself right at the very beginning. And I was kind of, because I've sort of found myself occasionally going in circles because the way that we all talk about immersion is really different coming from very different perspectives and it can mean so many different things to so many people and so I looked at and I and I'd scribbled a couple of definitions for myself early on and I think the one that I'd kind of come up with for, for my particular work was kind of using immersive or sorry using media technologies emerging media technologies to um, in some way augment the world or to create a sense of presence in a world that is in some way augmented beyond the physical reality actually around you and in a way that kind of still stands for a lot of the things that I've been looking at and thinking through so maybe I wasn't as narrow as I'd initially thought with my feelings and I, and I also looked at you know some of the literature around the quite techy VR kind of approaches and there were actually still some useful signposting points in there even if it wasn't the kind of work that I was really interested in delving into so Mel Slater for instance had an interesting um, divide that he talked about immersion being for him an actual measurable state mm. using technology whereas presence was the subject was what he called the subjective um, position and, and, and how someone feels how much they feel present in that space 
And so while that might not be precisely the definition I would go forward with, though that kind of differentiation is quite useful, I think, the kind of the subjective versus externally measurable kind of approach that you want to take. Well, there's something interesting in that as well that, that I kind of get that immersion, I think it's important in some ways to think about the difference between immersion and immersive media or, yeah. or being immersive in a way. Because, yeah, immersion... I, I can, so I'd be interested to read that actually because I, I think you can think about it as a state. Um, I think the question is about what are you immersed in um, mm. is what becomes interesting really. So how would you define immersion now uh, in, a sh in a short sentence? I think I would still stick pretty closely to that um, sentence that I made as, as a note to myself which was let me think if I can get this right immersion being well actually that's, that's a good question because I, I'm actually kind of conflating the two things I divided the, pres okay. the presence and the immersion so I don't know I'm going to have to think about it for another second actually for me it's, it's, it's being in something I think it's as simple as that immersion is being in something I think the question that I've been asking is do these kind of media forms and artworks and things, are they conscious of what, they're, what you're immersed in when you're taking part in it? Like, the, are they making an assumption that because you're visually immersed that your presence and your, your body and your, your mindset is also immersed in that? Um, and, and what about the other things we're immersed in all the time? You know, so, so that's for me, immersion as a definition is it, I, I do the really simple thing of just saying it's in something, but I think when you start thinking about what it is you want to show that you're in, because we're all in stuff all the yeah. time, mm. you know, continuously, but um, it's almost like uh, maybe it's about focus, maybe it's about sort of, or attention, it's like what, what level of immersion is this thing, uh, this, you know, this artifact, object, experience, what level of immersion is that drawing your attention to? Um, yeah, I think that's actually really useful. I like that simple approach of immersion is just being fully in something. And actually one of the co-eyes on this project, I think early on, talked about levels or layers of immersion and how people are actually quite adept at jumping between those mm -hmm. layers. So you might be fully immersed in something in the sense that your attention is fully in this particular space and then maybe you jump out of it for a bit and then maybe you jump back in and so and, and we're quite good at that um, and what that does for me is it asks it leads to a bunch of other questions so why immersion you know why if you're making this particular piece of media does that need to be something that's immersive in this sense And that does relate to a lot of other questions going on in media research around attention and sort of how you focus and lead attention um, and whether you need to have full immersion in a piece or whether it's okay to have those, those layering opportunities mm. where you do kind of flick from the physical reality around you to something else um, and there may be pieces that actually do want your full immersive attention in something for that full experience and that's why you put them behind a headset or you put them behind headphones or you you add that extra layer um, but there are a lot of media forms where you don't necessarily need to do that and that kind of split form of attention is also fine I mean I think that's why augmented stuff is really interesting when you start talking about it as an immersive form because it's I mean I, I've got this kind of take at the moment that a good augmented reality works augment something um, and the thing they're augmenting is part of the, the work. And I, I guess what I mean by that is I'm a bit tired of AR displays that are just on a table because it's kind of, what, what's the role of the table? Yeah, here, why you know? here? Yeah, why here? But so good ones that kind of utilise the, the, the space they're presented and somehow draw on that content. I think what's interesting in that is um, what you're immersed in at that point is not just the piece, the, the, the mediated content. You're immersed in that environment that it's placing itself in and it's somehow that that edge and that scale of immersion is being changed by the piece your sort of attention what you're being drawn to is getting bigger and bigger yeah exactly so 
And that's actually why I think Duncan's work is so interesting because it really matters where you are. Mm. It's not something you can go and sit in a dark room and mm. do. It adds a layer to your existing reality and it kind of, in a way, immerses you in both of those spaces equally and simultaneously. And that's what's important about it, the connection and the interplay between those two things rather than something... And I, th- and I personally find those kinds of works a lot more interesting than something that I can take away and do by myself in wherever. Although I often call it lazy filmmaking. I, you know, <laughs> it's like I just go, well, there's the, all the stuff here. I don't need to stage <laughs> don't need to anything. I'll just yeah. give you the soundtrack bits. I'll write the script and the soundtrack, but I won't bother to film it. So I'll just put you there um, and try to draw it that way. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, what... <coughs> uh, there's a couple of things based on those two kind of points. Um, how would you guys as practitioners um, get draw the, draw attention to things that you want the audience to get get attention to and thinking about um, everyone always being immersed how would you uh, ensure their transition from whatever they're being immersed in right now to the thing you want them to be focusing on how would you kind of guide them through that what was your what would you be your, your ideal onboarding process I mean, it, for me, it changes from piece to piece. Um, there's there's some techniques, uh, there's some specific techniques I use, but they're never like this will always work techniques because it does depend on the content. But I mean, for example, like the the piece I've been making at the moment, only expansion, which is augmented audio. So it's it's you, you wear headphones, but there's microphones on them and they draw in sound from the outside and they, they blend that with pre-recorded material. The, the beginning of that piece um, uses, uh, I call them structural elements, they're different sort of ways, techniques, um, and the, the first one in that is settling. And, and what settling is, is this, you know, that transition from saying, you've been in the world, you're sitting on the street, now you're still sitting on the street, but I'm, but I want to like put an edge here, and I want to say now you're in something. So at that like point, yeah. So, that, so it's like the curtain opening kind of yeah. thing, and in, and so I do that by not having the microphones on. Um, so there's the, at the beginning it's sealed off, and it's just pre-recorded material, and it's quite loud, and it's um, and it draws on kind of cinematic, uh, compositional sort of styles, purely as a in a way as a cultural reference. Um, because, I mean, for two reasons. One is watching cinema is, is kind of one of the only times we see the world without its inherent sound. Um, so by sort of sh- putting you looking at the world but shutting out the, the real audio and giving you a fake, non-diegetic soundtrack, I'm kind of saying, okay, now let's look at this slightly differently. Let's, let's frame this experience as a, a cinematic kind of mode. So once I've done that, then I've kind of defined the sort of edge and then I can start turning on the microphones and then hopefully when they start hearing the world around them it's already within this this kind of frame of the experience I've created. But I mean that's that's just in that piece. So that's an example. Yeah, there's a I mean there's a couple of different levels there in what you're asking. It's the the how you actually set up once the piece starts itself. And you know, there's a lot of there's a f- several conventions from traditional film that have flowed into VR and 360 filmmaking so you know when we see a traditional film it might not start right at the beginning there might be a scene first but there's generally an opening credits or something that kind of give us time to I like Duncan's phrase of settling this kind of you know getting used to the space that we're in understanding okay we're here to experience a piece of media and a lot of VR works might have something like that at the beginning but there are several that also just launch you straight in to a very complex 360 degree world and then things start happening and it's actually quite disorientating and really difficult to get a handle on and and you know I've spoken to a few people who say they would love some time at the beginning to just actually look around a little bit understand where they are and 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 settle into that space a little bit and then I guess the other side of that is also just in terms of exhibition Um, I've been to a whole bunch of um, immersive interactive Um, yeah, I've been to a whole bunch of immersive and interactive festivals recently over the past year and it's been really interesting to look at the different ways that they present these works and how they explain to the audience what it is they're about to do, whether they explain anything, 
Um, and I know for a lot of artists it can be um, something important to them that the audience go through a process of discovery without revealing too much. And I certainly don't mean giving away all the story at the beginning, but giving some kind of markers and signposts on what to expect, I've realised is really quite important. And, and the way that someone introduces someone to a space and, and puts a headset on them or gives them a phone and headphones and sends them off or something like that can really be the absolute difference between what kind of an experience that person has. Um, and when a lot of projects are kind of thrown together in a large arcade sort of space, that can be really difficult as well to have the time to do that, to have people understand or to pick up and gain an understanding of each different kind of experience along the way and what it is they're about to see and hear and, and what it is they're supposed to take away from it. Part of that's a t uh, like a period of time issue, right? In the you know we yeah. don't. It would be brilliant. That I'd love it if every time you went to the cinema there was a talk <laughs> that said what you're about to see <laughs> is staged. It's not real. Yeah, uh, this true. This is the news. There's going to be things moving on the screen. It's going to be dark, <laughs> and we and we'd rather you didn't talk or throw popcorn. Yeah, at each I other do. Out. I do feel like we're so in a transitional yeah, moment and we'll, very much. We'll get past that. Yeah. Um, but at this stage, yeah, we're we're sort of. We're stopping people running out of the movie theatre, essentially. At the yeah, and we, and we kind of have to be at the yeah. moment. Like, th we do have to throw them all in a big room together because audiences aren't used to this work yet. And if we want them to come see it, we need to put it all on together. We need to make it cheap or free and kind of just enable people picking things up and, and, and trying them out. So that's sort of this, yes, transitional phase while, while we figure out what... And, and down the track, maybe that means kind of more considered curation on an individual level in gallery spaces or so on but but you need to have a really solid audience for the works before you can really start down that track I think yeah so we're getting a lot of wind yeah, here are you getting low yeah, yeah. yeah. not that it's just you get those really low end um, uh, yeah. hits, which are fine it's just um, I just put a limiter on it so I'm just gonna turn that off because it's not helping. Um, yeah okay where were we um, how do we guide audiences yeah. in? so how long how long do you think that will take and do you feel because there's there's a lot of big the kind of big companies who are investing a lot of in creating VR have recently kind of backed out. Do you think they've got a bit cold feet because not enough audience have picked it up because they're not used to the the, the rituals required for proper immersion? And do you feel like they're that this um, kind of acceptance of the um, the way into immersive experiences will happen just gradually, more naturally now, or do you think it needs to be uh, industrially encouraged? <laughs> I, I don't think that's something I can answer. It's not, yeah, it's not my field. I'm a maker. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. What what that industry does with VR, I'm not, it's not really for me to say. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's it's. I mean, you know. I could make some stuff up about what might happen, but I suspect also it'll be more interesting to look at it a few years down the track and actually see what what really happened. So yeah, I think that's probably it's kind of a less interesting question now than kind of talking through the actual fundamentals of the work that might emerge and mm -hmm. and then looking at it from that perspective maybe and seeing thinking through what kinds of exhibition and display and and, and audience experiences do we want to develop I suppose so sense? Blue Sky Thinking what uh, kind of exhibition or experience would you would you, would you love to make Ooh. I guess putting on my curator hat for a minute I think some of the interesting approaches in this area is really going to be a kind of a considered approach to the diversity of works like immersive media experiences are such a broad range of things and lo looking at for instance just simply the fellows that came to this fellowship experience and the backgrounds they all came from that 
kind of immediately demonstrates why it's not that useful to try and pin down a very tight definition of what immersive media is because it is this complex thing and when I was um, sort of wrangling my research from the fellowship into this manifesto that I wrote it very quickly became clear that you know yes I could come up with a few points that might be of use to different makers but there was not going to ever be some kind of checklist that was useful to everyone that wanted to make an immersive media experience quote unquote what was that? Oh, is he coming to drive off in a different direction, like to leave, do you think? Yes. Oh, it's this He's going this again. He's off. See ya. Hooray. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. And actually, this might be taking a bit of a left turn, but um, some of the things that I'm really kind of interested in watching the progress of is the sort of the personalization angle on experiences through um, machine learning AI those kinds of technologies and on the flip side of that I'm also terrified about what those things bring in terms of data collection and surveillance and so I'm really interested in looking to how people start to manage that as we progress so for instance I've talked before about you know closing people off behind a headset. Well, voice activation is becoming kind of the interfaceless interaction with computers to some extent for a lot of people. And I think that's really interesting because I think it increases the possibilities for shared experience, and which was something I said I wanted to look into at the beginning of this thing. And so if you can connect with a computer by talking and speaking, it's much easier to do that with other people in the room with you. So on the one hand, I think that's a fantastic advance. And on the other hand, I do not want a voice assistant in my home and I'm not interested in engaging in that for many reasons of, of privacy and, and, and quite serious um, political concerns. So I'm very interested in kind of thinking through and how we might actually manage those contradictions into the future. Uh, blue, blue sky thinking? For me it's quite easy actually. I th my blue sky thinking is I just want to have better quality augmented audio. So at the moment, um, the frustration is that we, we still have to deliver the audio through some kind of electromagnetic coil, through a headphone of some form. Um, and in the work I'm doing, I'm constantly trying to blend that with what we're hearing with our ears. Um, and in the kind of case of like things like the Bose headsets, you have no control over the ears, you just have the external. And in the systems I'm making, you're, you're sort of dependent on a microphone feed into the ears. So for me, I just, I'd really like some kind of direct neural tapping so you could just accurately control whether it's the sound coming in from your ears and then it, and then it feeds immediately and it's just working on a neural level, you know, a la Black Mirror style. Um, and then I could have full quality audio going straight into your brain and choose whether it's coming from your ears or from a Oh, interesting. Source. That's pretty okay. wild. And so how would... You wanted Blue Sky. Uh, <laughs> yeah, totally. I don't, I don't know how far that is. I mean, you know, we're going we're, we're gonna to shift into direct yeah. to the brain type media, aren't we? Somewhere along the line. Yeah, it's an interesting... It might not be it in my lifetime. Might not be soon, but eventually, yeah. Well, I mean, they're already looking yeah. at ways to But so before that, it's just improvement in that field, really. The, the you know, the Sennheiser stuff is, is really good. Um... It doesn't quite let me do what I want to do at the moment, um, but it's getting there. It's pretty close. What do you mean by Sennheiser stuff? Uh, Sennheiser's Ambio system, um, oh, yeah. and a, and a few come like the Apple AirPods have got microphones in, and Samsung make a pair. But Sennheiser's, from what I've tested so far, have the best microphones. I mean, they're a microphone company, and they so their Ambio system is headsets with in-ear headphones with mics built in, and they're pitching them as record binaural sound for your VR experience. Yeah, so they're really. pitching them as kind of binaural mics. Um, but what they what they allow when you plug them into an iPhone at the moment is you can balance between the microphone feed from outside and the and the mediated stuff so you can sort of create augmented stuff. But it's but for me it's still um, the processing I'm doing on the sound creates feedback issues and all kinds of stuff. So we're not quite there yet but it's it's definitely fixable and doable. That does start to lead to some really kind of chewy questions about where sound's coming from and what is your existing reality. Yeah. Um, 
that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. you know, with visual media, particularly screen-based media, the screen has edges, you know, exactly where they begin and end. You can look away. In a VR space, that's obviously much more complicated. You're looking all around you, but you can close your eyes to remove yourself from it, and you also know that everything around you is in that mediated space. But with sounds, when you're adding layers of constructed sounds on top of the, the existing ones around you and if you are no longer able to tell the difference between where they come from that's really interesting yeah what does that mean about but isn't that also where visual AR you know has the potential to go as well when it reaches yeah, that quality and we are doing it with contact lenses or with normal glasses and so our edges are the same as the edges we're used to mm. and, the, and the actual visual quality is high enough We'll, we'll hit similar difficult kind of interesting territory yeah, there. Yeah, that, that good, that interesting point between so that image that I'm seeing over there appears in for all intents and purposes to be a part of my yeah. existing reality to the point where I can't tell if the person next to me who's not wearing a headset can see that or not because I don't know whether that's there for them too. So yeah, that does also... Well, I mean, we're caring. also like, you know, we're primed as well... But, you know, with sound, we're primed to be able to hear things we can't see. That, um, for the people who are listening to this, you know, they, they know that's a bus, they don't see it, but that doesn't seem strange to them at all. Um, and even right now, I'm not looking at the bus, but I can hear it, and I'm really used to that. So we're kind of, it's, that's why I find it really interesting working with augmented audio, because you're you're in such a blur continuously because you can you know just start adding things and if if you kind of set it up well for people it's oh no that i just heard that um and i assume it happened and it was real uh, mm, and that means something and i have reference points yeah, for what yeah. that means what do you think it would mean for uh, children who have yet to establish those reference points I don't think it. I don't think it's anything. I don't think it's different because there's always ambiguity in sound. There's always a kind of what's making that sound. So there's always things that we haven't heard before that we hear, and we have, you know, evolutionary responses to that. Um, and I think, I think if you're if you're giving children an augmented sound experience where there's sounds that don't have visual causality, they're <laughs> I think they're probably learning the same as us when if I've never heard an airplane before, you know, or if I've never seen an airplane before, the, the feeling I would get right now is is very similar to a child who's never had that um, causal relationship between a sound and what's what's making it. So I think we're still continuing through that. I mean I'm not a pe 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 no what's what's pediatrician? Yeah, there's a specific around child psychology, isn't there? I'm not an expert in that field, so I don't know. But I also, I also don't care because I'm not we're making work for children. Like I think there's some people who are really exploring those areas and doing really interesting stuff. For me, I'm trying to deal with issues and problems that require a level of um, uh, understanding, but at the same time. I work with music and sound purely for its visceral impact that, that hopefully comes without cognitive kind of knowledge that, that physically kind of hits you and has an impact. So, you know, if I can do that, traumatise the children <laughs> as well as adults, it doubles the audience, right? Yeah, I mean, I do understand. I do understand the concerns around... Um, like, I do understand why we're not particularly keen on giving headsets and immersive media experiences to kids yet you know there, there is that research that I think has emerged that shows that um, if children are experience a virtual reality piece for instance the way they form memories might mean that they internalize that in such a way that they feel like it really happened um, and so I think that some of really? the, is that the are they done to some yeah I think so or well, there's some suggestion that that's the case I'm not sure <laughs> Sound, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, there it is. 
It's oh. Chucky Laps. Was there a minute ago? Are you Banksy? Oh. Are you Banksy? Yes. Don't call this number. Wow. <laughs> So does that mean everyone who's not Banksy should call that number? Yeah. Did you see the number? No. That's kind of brilliant. We should call it, but yeah. I didn't actually see it. I didn't. Next <laughs> <laughs> time it comes past, it's disturbing. Well, snap a picture. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's really random. <coughs> <coughs> oh. <coughs> so yeah, I mean, I think my understanding is that there has been some research that does show that young kids do internalise virtual experiences in the same way they bed down real memories. And so that's behind some of the reticence to make these kinds of media in a, in a really broad way for children. Um, and so, yeah, and I understand, obviously, that can be really concerning, that if you can't um, keep control of the kind of media experiences that you put in front of your children, then that can become really problematic. Um, and also the simple fact that if you're talking VR... Um, a headset is something that someone can't look over your shoulder and see what you're watching. So, you know, if you're watching your kids at home watching YouTube, you can kind of keep an eye and kind of peer in and see what it is they're looking at, but you can't do that with a VR headset. Um, so I do understand those concerns around children kind of creating their realities. but And that's why I, I understand why we have, you know, film festivals and things that are geared towards adults because we're not really sure yet what the actual impacts are. Having said that, I don't know what other research is continuing and I know most of the VR headsets sort of say, you know, we don't recommend this for under 13 year olds, but I gather that's simply based on the Facebook cutoff age of when you're oh, allowed to. I think that's then? why they've done it, is that we Such an arbitrary um, thing. So yeah, so it's, it is in that sense completely arbitrary why they've decided that that's the age that you can use. I think it's head size as well for the headset straps. Yeah, a little bit, yeah, yeah. But I think that was just a convenient number, basically, that they kind of went for. you know media for kids has been changing forever and it's yeah. still changing and so from that perspective I'm also a little bit like well you know let's get over the moral panics a little bit about what we're making for kids because it's always been the case that adults kind of freak out a little bit about what kids are watching and doing and I think as long as you're kind of taking a sensible approach and, and actually just being aware of what your kids are doing and talking to them about it I don't think it's really a new substantively different stage now necessarily and I think I mean some of the stuff I've been interested in like you know getting people to walk around with an EMF meter to to hear all the the electromagnetic fields and waves around you I think it's a really useful thing for kids to do I would you know, like I would class that as an immersive experience because it's sort of exposing you to what's already there um, I, th I think more kids should do that, so they start, mm. so they're sort of conscious of that stuff from a from quite an early age, in a way. That's a but good that's, point. You know, that's a, that's more, I guess, a political argument in terms of what I'm trying to do. Yeah, but I, I I actually think the political argument is is a really important one. I mean, one of the reasons I'm starting to kind of shift my attention to things that are kind of adding layers to your existing reality rather than taking you out of it, is to try and think about how we can actually connect people more strongly to the world around them and from a really unapolog unapologetically activist stance, you know, I mean, there are some really terrible things happening to the world right now and we need people to start thinking about actions they can take and, you know, kids seem to have a pretty good handle on what needs to happen and, and, and ways of taking action and so, <coughs> excuse me, maybe that's, you know, maybe they're a really good audience to kind of engage with. I'm not sure yet what kind of form of media I'm talking about, I suppose. Um, I think something that I've been looking at is this idea of kind of creating a connection with the natural world and encouraging feelings of kind of awe and bewilderment and joy and catharsis and whether that might trigger in people um, some kind of you know, desire to actually engage more deeply with the existing natural world. I don't know yet. I was reading some interesting research this morning that... Um, was actually looking at VR experiences of animal embodiment, so actually taking on the body of an animal in a VR 
experience. Seen a piece like that. Oh, really? Yeah, two two car one in two two in a car one. Um, well, this American. one, it, this was like very kind of psychology lab based study mm. sort of thing, and it found, that, <coughs> sorry, it found that people did actually feel a stronger connection with nature and a stronger concern about environmental risk than people that just viewed the experience on a flat screen, and that those um, feelings persisted for up to a week, I think. So, you know, there is something in there that's useful. I don't know what it is or what how I want to take it forwards yet but there is some interesting research being done around that kind of question I think <coughs> a killer last question oh, yeah. finale question Do you, do you have any advice for people who are looking to kind of get into the immersive space or uh, do you have any um, thoughts about your experiences as, as fellows <clears throat> and how, how would you advise other fellows? The best guidance would be Julia's manifesto and my design <laughs> notes. I mean, that's all you need, I think. Very true. Um, uh, I mean, I think the, quest, the, the question, the best advice, I think the singular best advice in terms of going into the immersive space is to ask yourself why. If you're, if you're doing it because it's all the rage, not, not really. Is that, is that really a reason to make anything? <laughs> that, I'd say that would be the first <laughs> question. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good starting point. I mean, I there have been a lot of people who've sort of got in touch, maybe with like the IDOCS project that I work on or with me as being a fellow and sort of say they've got these great ideas for like maybe a 360 degree documentary or something else. And, and you can very quickly tell when it's a piece that's, actually something that would make sense to be immersive in some way or when it's something that's someone's thinking oh apparently this is what everyone's doing now so this is the way I need to do this because it, clearly not everything needs to be an immersive media piece there are some yeah. really great works that exist in in completely different forms so I, um it is an interest it's 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 a very interesting starting point to take with everything why why do this I did some consultancy on a project and one of the questions asked they said um, we want this bit to be much more immersive, and I and I said, what 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 do you mean by that? And they just they waved their hands around, and said, you know, more immersive. And and I realised that, yeah, that's why we need a bit more granularity because that doesn't really mean anything to just say that. Um, you know, if you if you think about all the things we talked about before, those layers and yeah. Um, <coughs> so yeah, I think advice would be. So, yeah, same. Look at look at the whys and and look at um, what what it is you actually mean when you when you say I want to work in immersive media in a way. Yeah, I think to add on to that, my big piece of advice would be just think really broadly about immersion. Kind of back to where we started was this idea of immersion being a really really potentially broad and complex thing. Um, I would really recommend getting away from this idea of the viewer being. A phrase I really liked that I came across was the conscious dot, that you are just a kind of a pair of eyes seen <laughs> placed in this virtual world or something. That's good. Where and is that from? I've been okay, trying to dig it up, it up, but I need to try and find it. The conscious dot is kind of great. And think about the bodies. That's something I'm kind of interested in looking into more. Like, how does your whole body inhabit this space or this immersive world? Or what else is immersive about this? Um, so yeah, just taking that really, really broad definition of immersion, I think, is a is a useful starting point. And it might be that what you thought was immersive about your piece might actually be something quite different about it potentially. Yeah. What was the other part of the question? There was another part to it. Uh, things that you take away from being a fellow. Uh, yeah, like that? I think so. Like, oh. Uh, general fellowship thoughts, good or bad. I think good. I mean, I think what I've come away with is, is on a sort of confidence level, I've realised there's a lot of stuff that I've learned over the last 15, 20 years across numerous forms of work 
that's really applicable to this space. Um, I mean, and actually trying to unpack that and sort of turn it into kind of useful knowledge, that's, that's, been, that's been really good. I mean, you know, I made a, the first kind of art commission I ever did in Bristol was, a, um, was in a flight simulator. And you were, you know, and you're flying through, you, you know, essentially sound as a 3D object with sort of visuals. Um, it would be a classic kind of VR piece now. We did it in a flight simulator, so you're physically kind yeah. of moving through it. But, you know, the idea of talking about that as an immersive work didn't... I'm going to get it this time. I really want to get that. I really want to call the number. Oh, really? It's the angle. Yeah, it's like almost weird. Well, anyway, yeah, so so that's been really good for me in a way, thinking, uh, you know, but maybe I do know some useful stuff. Because a lot of the time I've not, well, I have out and out rejected VR, but more in my own, like it's not something I'm that interested in making myself. I'm happy to make soundtracks for other people's, but it's not a field I'm interested in making. It's not what, how I'm trying to speak to the world. But actually, there's a lot of stuff that's, Kind of useful, I think, from from other work I've done. So that's been kind of I like that. Yeah, I'd probably say something similar to be honest. To the kind of on one level, an awareness that I actually did know some stuff yeah, <laughs> after I've kind of coming to it, going, "Am really I supposed well. to be here? Is this really <laughs> yeah. where I fit?" And then realizing that actually most people were kind of thinking the same thing a little bit, and that once you, <coughs> excuse me, once you kind of cherry picked. Oh, hang on. <coughs> Yeah, once you manage to tease out the elements of what everyone was doing and kind of find some common threads and then also some really out there kind of divergences, that was a really lovely part of it. And also, I, you know, I kind of thrive on collaborative opportunities for us to some extent and just being in a room with a bunch of really interesting, engaged people in itself, whether it's about immersion or not, is kind of a fabulous thing to be a part of. And it can kind of lead to all kinds of sparks that are about this or that might be about something else. And that's all really fantastic too. If people feel like when they want to get in contact with you, uh, can you tell them how or tell them not to? You say you'll tell them not to? Or, or tell them not to. Uh, I'm Duncan Speakman. Um, I assume it'll say it on a, I'm, I'm the only Duncan like Speakman that. on the internet, so it's useful. Yeah, and Julia Scott Stevenson, there aren't too many of us around either, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, look for my manifesto on Immerse News on Medium, or I'm on Twitter as well, so it should be easy to do. So, yeah. Real. Thanks very much. Cool, thanks Banksy. Yeah. For the, uh... <laughs> for the accompanying soundtrack. <laughs> Maybe you should put the, if we find the phone number out, you should put it on the... <laughs>